Hi, I'm Michael Fagan. Excuse all the technical hiccups, but it must be the weather in Toronto. Wouldn't be the same without it. Welcome to our first virtual event in advance of the annual George Brown College CHCA Wine Symposium, which will be held live in late June 2022. George Brown College is located on the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations and other Indigenous peoples who have lived here over time. For today's events, participants are encouraged to use the chat room forum to share your thoughts and bring forward questions. James Pollock is managing the chat room today and we'll be reaching out to James throughout the discussion to hear what you have to say. As we look forward to 2022, the wine industry is facing a host of challenges. The pandemic, climate change, trade restrictions, and changing consumers' needs have all had a profound impact. As trade professionals, we all need to respond and find innovative ways to move forward and thrive. Today, we're in conversation with Jancis Robinson, who is uniquely qualified to lead our wide-ranging discussion. Jancis Robinson is Britain's preeminent wine writer and journalist. She is the founder editor of the Oxford Companion to Wine. She co-authored with Hugh Johnson, The World Atlas of Wine, and is co-author of Wine Grapes, a master work on wine grape varieties. Jancis qualified as the master of wine in 1984, and in her distinguished career has won more awards than I can list. Since 2005, she's helped choose wines for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, who presented her with an OBE in 2003. Jancis travels worldwide to conduct wine events, often for the global initiative Room to Read, which supports literacy and girls' education. Please join me now as we virtually and warmly welcome Jancis Robinson to Toronto and to the Centre for Hospitality and Culinary Arts. Jancis, welcome. Thank you very much, Michael. You didn't mention what I spend most of my day doing. <laughs> Writing about what do you do most of the day? <laughs> I feed the monster, which is jancisrobinson.com, where we are crazy enough to publish two new articles every day. And then I also have to write a weekly column for the Financial Times, which goes for, it's, a, it's an international paper. So I, I'm used to writing for an international readership, which is, is quite fun. And I, I love the style you take in your writing, and I applaud all that you've been doing with Jancis. Robinson.com, and we're going to be we're going to be talking more about that uh, in a minute. But we we know your fingers are nimble. We know you're on the keyboard all the time. But tell us tell us briefly, how did you get started? I wasn't brought up with wine. Um, in my generation, that was uncommon. Um, but I was introduced to wine at Oxford and had the seminal glass. Or bottle shared a bottle of Chambol Musignilles Amoureuse 1959 and just realized how much realized how much stuff was in that glass you know and it was so much better than student plonk and it made you think but you realized there was history and geography and psychology and economics and just a heck of a lot worth studying so what appealed to me about wine was this combination of massive sensual pleasure with obviously a lot of intellectual stimulation as well. Um, but I didn't leave Oxford saying, okay, I'll be a wine writer because way back then the subject of wine and food in which I was equally interested had zero social status. And my peers would have thought I was mad to waste an Oxford education on something as frivolous as wine. But it was uh, about three or four years later having lived in France for a year, being surrounded by people for whom eating and drinking was very important, that I was determined to go back to London and find a job in either wine or food. And I was very lucky because I was offered assistant editorship of a wine trade magazine, which set me on my way. And I've been writing about wine now for, for nearly 46 years, I think. It's terrible. That is amazing. <laughs> it's shocking to me. <laughs> Uh, someday we'll have to do a Google search and just see how many words that has been over that length of time. <laughs> uh, now, now, if you had not found such a prestigious career in wine, what else might have you considered as a career? 
started off in travel because I, I, I do love travel, although, um, you know, we all have to literally clip our wings a bit now thinking about the, the ramifications for the planet. Um, and I was always really interested in food. Amazingly, at the time I applied for the wine job, the first wine job, I, I was thinking of there was a, a phenomenon then when young girls would cook for directors, inevitably male, in their boardrooms in sort of particularly financial institutions in London. And I think I was even considering that. Thank heavens that fate did not befall me. And there was a teacher at school who said uh, she was very surprised I got into Oxford and she thought really I should be a, a window dresser at one of London's better stores. <laughs> Uh, and my no. first my first article actually was not about wine or food it was about fashion when i was 15 in the local paper <laughs> well that, a lot of people say wine is fashion so you followed that yeah, trend right along true. yeah yeah and i <laughs> i certainly am responsible for the um entry in the oxford companion to wine on on fashion which is always quite fun to to write i bet i bet now, now, in 2003, uh, Her Majesty awarded you an OBE, the Order of the British Empire. What does that honor mean to you? Um, we all keep it a little bit quieter about the British Empire nowadays than we used to. Um, it means a complete mystery to me. You know, you have to be proposed to get one of these honors. And I still don't know who proposed me. Um, but it came out of the blue. And of course, it was a massive honor just to feel that my work was recognized on, a, on some sort of national scale. And of course, um, it made my parents hugely proud. You know, it's one of those things where the odd person toys with refusing it because, you know, you don't agree with the government or whatever, whatever. But most people are swayed by the, the, the effect that such an honor will have on their family and the cho chance to go to Buckingham Palace. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's quite an honor and well-deserved. Well deserved. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of your writing and your books. And I, I know when I started uh, my career in, in wine, and that's back to the mid '70s when I started working in a retail store. Um, Hugh Johnson's book and your books were some of the my, my must-haves. And and as I continued in my career, I made them available to all of my staff uh, as a good as an excellent reference. Now, the World Atlas of Wine is now in its eighth edition. What, what makes the eighth edition special? The expanding world of wine, so, and which has to be recorded. Um, and, um, you know, we just, we, we desperately try to keep up with, with, I mean, what's extraordinary is that the whole shape of the world of wine is changing and vineyards moving ever closer to the poles. They can't get much closer to the South, South Pole, but there are people planting new land in the Patagonia. Um, the New Zealanders and the Australians can't go any further. Um, but, you know, Northern Europe, um, well, England has become a, a serious wine producer. I never thought I'd see that in my lifetime. And all sorts of um, countries in Northern Europe are starting to produce really quite, quite drinkable wine. Um, and the challenges being thrown up in Southern Europe and particularly North Africa, of course. Um, and, 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 and then the huge expansion in Asia. You know, we have to, the, the, chi the pages on China have to be updated a, a lot each time. Um, I wonder whether we'll devote a page to India in the ninth edition. It's quite possible. Yeah. Possible, and, yeah. That, yeah. I mean, the, the eighth is still a lot of old world, but the new world areas and evolving areas are really showing through. Um, I, I was pleased to see some more expansion on Canada. Canada, uh, for instance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one thing I should say about the eighth edition is that I, com have, I completely rewrote the introductory pages, which are quite extensive. And, um, you know, really to take into account not just climate change, but all the sorts of technical and scientific advances and the greater understanding we have now of how vines and soil interact or all, uh, all that kind of thing uh, so that I, I think is one huge difference between the seventh and between the eighth and previous editions um, but I, it, it always annoys me because 
people will say, oh yeah, I've got the World Atlas of Wine. I've got the third edition. And I, I know that, you know, it takes two solid years work of a huge team of people to update each edition. So each one really is worth getting folks. <laughs> you know, I, I lost track, was it the early 70s was when the first edition came out and 71. The, the yeah. industry has been nothing but change. So there is yeah. so much, so much to cover. I'm sure Canada wasn't in the first edition and New no, Zealand no. <laughs> New Zealand wasn't in the first edition. You do you know that the very first professional wine tasting I went to was of Ontario wines. In I did not know that. Yeah, in 1976. And I met Hugh Johnson there in Canada House in London. Wasn't the best wine tasting I ever went to, Ontario wines in 1976. Um, but it taught me a great lesson because I was listening to all these much more established wine writers talking about the wines and describing them and realizing that how they described them was often completely different between the individual tasters. And I think it gave me a confidence to just go my own way and follow what I really thought. And that there was obviously no single right judgment on a wine. And you know, we just- That's a great that's a very good observation because and the way you write you write with confidence and when we when i spend all of my career trying to encourage people to explore wine and the one thing that everybody needs is just that little bit of confidence to trust your own taste and i yes, jokingly I mean, if say I, if i write I would jokingly say you yeah, would yeah. jokingly say yeah. that that's what i love best about my job is i'm never wrong yeah. <laughs> I'm just sharing my thought. <laughs> yes, no, that's true. That's true. Um, but um, yes, I hope I'm not dogmatic. I'd, I've always thought that um, people should follow their own taste. And if I can educate people sufficiently for them to make up their own minds, that's I've, I've done my job rather than inculcating them with my own prejudices or whatever. Let's go back just a sec. You were talking about your first uh, introduction to Wines of Canada back in the early 70s, and certainly you've tried hundreds since then. Uh, what are your thoughts of Canadian wines today? The, it's the progress I've seen is certainly very exciting. Um, and I, it's for, maybe, I don't know, I haven't co counted up whether we see more BC wines or more Ontario wines, but what a thrill to see wines coming from other provinces as well. Um, and the, the quality, we, we certainly don't get any rubbish, any bad Canadian wine in the UK, not worth shipping it. Um, but I, I suppose, you know, it's been quite thrilling seeing some really nice Chardonnays and Pinots coming from Ontario and, and sparkling wines coming from sometimes even further east. And I'm just about, in fact, a, a friend of mine, Arnica Rowan um, from Okanagan, she, I actually saw her here last night and she handed over uh, 13, I think, bottles of BC wine, hand-picked for me to, to have a look at. So it's too early for me to uh, pronounce on them yet. <coughs> <Excuse> <laughs> well, we'll, uh, we'll check back in next week on that. Yeah, all right. <laughs> oh, no problem. Actually, we're talking about wine, Canadian wines, the 1970s. One, one of our uh, participants today is Tony Asler, and, and Tony has a question. I'll just throw it over to James, and uh, James, you can uh, bring that question forward. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. Uh, Tony's question to Jancis was, uh, uh, in retrospect, what is the book that you look back on with the most pleasure? Pleasure, and this is supposed to be one of mine. Hmm. I don't associate the big books that I'm, I have written with pleasure. <laughs> um, they've been a hard slog. Um, I suppose probably the, the book that was the most fun to write was one um, I associate with Toronto, actually. It, uh, it was my professional memoir, which is called uh, Confessions of a Wine Lover in the UK and Tasting Pleasure in the US. I don't know which edition you have. It came out in 1997 and it was a sort of uh, autobiography of my life up to then, but with an emphasis on, on wine. And it went into paperback. And I remember doing a book signing in Toronto. It probably was a subsequent 
edition of the Atlas or something. And a young guy came up to me and waved a very, very battered paperback copy of this book at me rather grudgingly and saying, I've just backpacked around Australia and this was the only book I had with me. So I had to read it over and over again as though it was my fault, but. Uh... <laughs> Aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, you, that book launch was probably at the cookbook store, and Alison yeah. Fryer, who had the store, is is one of our participants. Uh, a well. wonderful <laughs> store, and I think yeah. it's much missed, probably. Yeah, yeah indeed. Mm. Now, now the eighth edition has um, you know, 230 unique detailed maps of the world's wine landscape. Um, Tell us briefly uh, how maps can help consumers learn more about wine in a particular wine region. Well, wine is essentially geography in a bottle. And I think it really does help your understanding if you can locate that particular point on the globe that the bottle in your hand is trying to express. After all, wine is one of very, very few consumables that we can buy that you can look at, you can know when it was produced, uh, you can know who produced it uh, if, as a primary producer, um, and you can know what's, which spot on the globe was actually responsible for it. Uh, so it's in a quite a privileged position. And if you like maps, as, as I do, um, it really helps, I think, to see the topography, to see uh, how it um, relates to other producers or other vineyards. Um, and we try to include as many geographical aspects as possible, you know, prevailing winds or what the climate's like and all that kind of thing, which all have, a, a as you know, a huge bearing on how the wine's going to taste. Huge bearing. And I, I congratulate the people that have created the maps for it. Uh, they've done a fantastic job. They're a great, great, great reference point. They are. They're, and I would love to say they're my creations but they're not <laughs> <laughs> um, now now with the um with the new edition we're bringing talking about new areas and you know there not everything makes it into the book H how do you decide uh what gets into the next edition and is it at the expense of something that was in previous ones usually it's at the, at the expense we have many preparatory meetings where we argue the toss about should this be added? Should that be left out the next edition? And it's it's, um, it's some of it's buzz, you know, because it, it's an international book that goes into many different languages and editions. Um, it has to be relevant throughout the world. Um, so I suppose, you know, I, I'd have to say that um, because Canadian wine is not that much exported, um, Canadian pages really have to fight for their um, position and Canadians have to buy lots of copies because that will <laughs> that will justify a, a nice lot of space for, for Canadian wine. Um, but for instance, uh, Indian wine that I mentioned just now doesn't yet have its own cover, uh, its own map because it's really exported even less than Canadian wine. So ideally, the wines have to have some sort of international presence. One of, the, one of the things with the world of wine, it's continuing to expand. New areas are coming up. They've been there forever, but they're gaining more attention. Uh, in your opinion, what are some up and coming regions that we should look for? And if not look for, think about visiting. Right. Well, if we're allowed to visit. Um, uh, I don't know how well entrenched these the, the wines are these particular two countries are in Canada, perhaps quite well, and I'm, I'm out of date to even mention them, but the two countries that we often mention to people who don't know all that much about wine are Portugal and Greece, for the same reasons that they have this array of indigenous grape varieties with wonderful characters of their own, um, and of, did not succumb to the great uh, Cabernet and Chardonnay Chardonnayization of vineyards around the world, um, and and the quality and the, the price is really really interesting. So those would be two, and and very high standards of winemaking. South Africa as well, I think, is wildly underappreciated in North America generally, certainly in the U.S. 
uh, there's, there's a sort of new wave of hugely ambitious wine producers there who are concentrating on old vines, particularly Chenin Blanc, which is the most planted grape variety in South Africa. Uh, and the, the partly thanks to the dismal performance of the RAND, the prices are, are very good as well. So those, um, those spring to mind. <clears throat> but you know, thing is, the most extraordinary thing is that quality improves pretty much every year, except when nature gets in the way. Um, everywhere. I mean, it's, you know, this, there's a lot of talk about a golden age of wine, and it, it really is. I mean, people won't believe that when I started drinking wine as a student in the late 60s, early 70s, only one bottle in every three was even really drinkable. They were so chock full of chemicals. And, um, and nowadays you can, and then there would be so many faults throughout the 70s and so many underripe wines and that were really quite painful to drink. Um, and, but nowadays you can, you know, the only fault that I encounter in wine is um, uh, thanks to a, a poor cork. And I haven't found that rate going down all that fast, I have to say. I mean, uh, just in the last week, I've encountered two or three badly TCA affected bottles. So I don't think the problem solved by any means. You, we were talking about new and emerging areas. You were mentioning Greece and, um, and one of the challenges where, what do, you, what do you see as the main challenges for some wine regions uh, to, you know, to, to reach globally, to, to, to gain customers' attention. Yeah. Greek, Greek is probably a good example because for me, uh, we were going over there in 2000 to do a documentary and I was so nervous. My biggest challenge was the words, being able to pronounce the Greek varieties. <laughs> They're great, yes. but I can't pronounce yes. them. Yeah, and then there was, a, for a long time, um, the Greeks didn't use their own alphabet rather than our alphabet on the labels, which was another... Um, hindrance, but they've got wise now, and most of the labels are, we can understand, or international markets can understand. Uh, but you see, but Portugal and Greece are interesting examples because they have something special to offer. Um, it is very difficult for countries or regions that are just producing the range of the same grape varieties and the same styles to make their mark, particularly since as more and more um, people are making wine around the world, the, the market is just so competitive. It's really, really difficult to stand out. So I suppose if you don't have an array of interesting indigenous grape varieties to sell, um, you have to do it through stories and through people and, and engage people with the background to the wines. I don't think it's enough just to say we've got a great Cabernet or a great Chardonnay, I'm afraid. Not anymore. It needs. It does. It does need that story. You're absolutely right. And it needs the producers to travel. I know I've been saying, uh, but or or to Zoom or whatever. But um, you can't, as a wine producer, you can't just stay on your land and hope that the world's wine buyers are going to come to you. You you've really got to work at at selling. Really have making. Yeah. And they really, one of the other benefits for traveling is they get to see the sophistication of the market and that they're trying to penetrate and see firsthand the competition they're dealing with. Because the selection of wine is just, it's, it can be crazy confusing for consumers. It can be overwhelming. So you've got Absolutely. to understand that. And also, I think um, it's very valuable for wine producers to meet up with other wine producers in other regions and maybe maybe absorb a few techniques or maybe see what they're doing wrong or, or you know, I know um, now that the Burgundians almost invariably, young ones, go and do a, uh, an internship, often in, say, New Zealand or Oregon, somewhere else with a, a kind of reputation for Pinot Noir, um, they have, that, that forms friendships and sometimes they can have natural hazards um, you know, like sunburn or something, which they can take advice from their newfound friends in an, in another region. So it's it's all to the good if, if um, to establish these communications things. One of the things I've found over the years is all winemakers there. It's a family. They all want everybody to succeed. They're happy to share experiences, 
and of course share each other's wine. So that's so true. It, so it true. wasn't always like that. You know, famous stories about the Burgundian villages where a wine producer wouldn't even would wouldn't even acknowledge a neighbor and wouldn't send a visitor. You know, would say, no, 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 I don't know where they are. You know. So it's great. It's much, much better now. Much better. Now, across the globe, many established areas are further dividing themselves into sub-regions and uh, micro-regions. And does this help consumers or does it further complicate things? It's an interesting question. I think the timing of it is quite um, crucial. And areas, regions which subdivide themselves too early, um, I think risk just complicating life. I'm thinking of perhaps Lodi in Northern California, uh, subdivided itself really before putting the Lodi name on, on the international stage. And even in Ontario, I think, um, maybe you did that, did things just very slightly too early. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm, mm. Um, ditto Oregon, um, or Willamette Valley rather. Um, you know, just a few years, not 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 a lifetime too early, yeah. but it's, well, it's when it when it's too early, it begs the question: Is it marketing or is it for reality? Yeah, you, um, are you need, and to do it, you need tasters to have a good chance of identifying blind which of those sub regions they're tasting. You know, you exactly. don't just do it for geographical reasons. Yeah, no, there's got to be a, a, a differentiating factor in the glass yeah. as well. I'm just gonna, we're gonna take a second. I'm gonna uh, uh, reach back out to James who's got some more questions from the audience at this point. James? If, if, um, if I could sneak in two, uh, two questions from uh, 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 participants in, in, uh, in the, uh, the talk today. Um, uh, Karen um, has asking Jancis if she could describe a notable or singular experience in wine that changed your outlook towards wine. I can't, I can immediately think of, of such an, an instance. The, my very first job was as a chambermaid in Italy's most expensive hotel. And I'd come from an England where wine was thought of as being something hugely exotic and, and valuable and special uh, and to be sort of venerated. And but staff meals at this, um, I was paid incidentally four pounds an hour. Um, uh, at staff meals, we were served the local wine as much as we liked. And if we wanted water that was guaranteed um, suitable to drink, we had to pay for it. And that showed me that in certain societies, wine was not this special um, sort of snobby kind of um, liquid. It was as common as, as a potato, you know. So that was that was one. My other question or is from uh, Emily, who's uh, asking about specifically Ontario wines commonly found in the UK market. Um, uh, which which wines are commonly found and in which stores? That is a very difficult question. I'm honestly scrolling, trying to think. Tell you what, now I'm I, I'm loath. I don't want to lose you. So I, I, what I would normally do is go to the tasting notes database of chancesrobinson.com and look to see which Ontario wines we've tasted most recently. Um, honestly, I, I think you'd be, you'd be very disappointed looking to see, to try and find Ontario wines in the UK. They're very few and far between. And please, if there's somebody um, who countermanding that opinion, please come on to the Q and A and and tell me what I've overlooked, but um, we get uh, we have a, usually an annual wines of Canada tasting in Canada House where we all have a chance to enthuse over the best wines on show. But as for the um, the orders that result, they are pretty thin and um, far between, few and far between. Um, the lovely uh, Terry from Selfridges you, uh, used to make sure that there was a good array of wines from his native British Columbia, um, but he's unfortunately no longer with us. And 
I don't know what's happened to the BC selection at Selfridges. So there'll probably be a handful in, in stores like Harrods would probably have one or two because they have such an international um, array of customers. But just in a regular bottle shop, I can't, can't think of any names that you would be sure of finding, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. But it's probably because of the prices. And that's fair. It's it's a challenge for everything. Even if you come and look at the wine stores here in the LCBO, there's a lot of stuff that isn't here. There's a lot mm -hmm. of things that are, but many areas are often, unfortunately, underrepresented. Yeah. And as proud Canadians, you know, we have, I guess what we have to do is go and travel and visit those stores and buy it so that they can replenish the shelf. So it makes good business <laughs> yes, sense. Too. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk about climate change for a minute. Um, it, it's real, and with any change, there's good and bad. Uh, more often, we hear about the negative impacts of climate change rather than anything positive coming out of it. Why do you think that is? Because we're heading for disaster, because the, um, you know, the, the bad things are so bad. Um, yeah, I can put, I often do put in an article, it's great that, um, German wine, German grapes all get ripe nowadays. Um, and that, you know, England has a, and Canada are major beneficiaries of climate change, but set that against the greater picture. Um, that's pretty, uh, those are pretty minor benefits compared to what's coming, coming at us at huge speed. And of course I speak very aware of the COP26 climate change conference in Glasgow uh, that starts on Sunday. Uh, I think we must all be very, very aware, of those of us who care about wine, of our um, major contribution to carbon emissions, which is the glass bottle. And I believe, I'm told, that Canada is one of the best, or certainly Ontario, has one of the best recycling rates in the world. Um, but uh, we just, we have to keep that up and... Um, also fight against these ridiculous heavy bottles, which are pure marketing. They don't do anything for the wine uh, and are making a, a yet more contribution because it's not just the production of bottles that is adding to our carbon emissions, it's the transport of them. So any heavy bottles are gonna you know, emit even more carbon. So if consumers can lobby producers and say, we don't need a heavy bottle to make us buy your product. Please, please save the planet and use lighter bottles. Uh, on JanicesRobinson.com, we now, if if we're able to, we now weigh all bottles and precede our tasting notes with the weight of a full bottle, so that we can call out the people who are using really heavy bottles and praise the people who are managing to get by with much lighter ones. Uh, and yeah. So One I think of the those, things with lighter are... bottles in Ontario, the LCBO, they introduce new standards for bottles under certain price points. They must be a lightweight glass, mm -hmm. and that's been adopted. So that's another way of uh, you know, that's uh, very companies good. Companies and that, retailers yeah. stepping in. That's a that's a very good move, and I, and I think the LCBO played a big part in the recycling business, haven't they? they uh, have, yes. But I also but there's also the, the slight. You know, to say, oh, if it's a cheap wine, it's got to be a light bottle. That slightly reinforces the thought that good wine deserves a heavy bottle. So, um, you know, I think we just need to be very aware. Good. I see James reaching out. He's got some more questions there. So I'll, I'll bring James back in for a minute. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me um, start here. Um, Sharon Ranson asking, how did you choose the wines for your daughter's recent wedding? for both the lunch and the reception? <laughs> That's a very <laughs> specific question. Um, for the lunch, it was um, what we had in quantity in the cellar, um, because we there were about 40 people at the, at the lunch, uh, and I didn't want anyone to go thirsty. In fact, I had to be stopped from adding six more bottles of champagne. Um, and in the evening, uh, when our daughter was threatening to have, you know, more than 150 people there, I knew that the cellar didn't contain enough wine 
suitable wine for them. So I chose some favourites from the retailer here that guarantees a sale or return. And I'm sad to say a heck of a lot of it went back because they're all, you know, average age, about 30. And there were cocktails and beer also on offer. And um, they were very keen on the cocktails and the beer, sadly. And this is something which we need to address because for the first time in my long professional life, in markets like Canada, US and UK, total wine sales are actually decreasing for the first time in my professional life, which is a danger, which is something, you know, I think it's because there's so much competition. There are also a lot of people who are not wanting to drink at all. Um, and, you know, we can't be complacent. I, I, most of the people that I know in the wine world grew up with, with um, sales just guaranteed to increase every year, and that's not happening anymore. So, much, so many options for people today. So we're going back to beer, it's spirits, it's non-alcoholic spirits, cannabis. There, there's so many of these alternatives. Hard and seltzer. Yes. Hard seltzer. Yeah. So we have to, it, we really have to be on guard and make wine attractive to them. Mm. Uh, it, and, and do you have any suggestions or tips to uh, on bringing well, those Well, I, I certainly think uh, um, th there's no doubt that in general, the, um, the market for natural wine and probably orange wine too is younger on average than the market for conventional wine. And I think it's a great mistake if people in the conventional wine world just turn their back on natural and orange as being freakish. Um, my personal hope, it, I think it's great that everyone pretty much uh, producing wine is using fewer and fewer inputs. And that's particularly true, but not exclusively of, of what's happening in the vineyard. Um, so that, <laughs> conventional producers are getting more and more natural if you like and meanwhile natural wine I think the the num the proportion of so-called natural wines that are good has been increasing rapidly so um, people who just dismiss the whole category because the first three natural wines they tasted tasted like cider or hamster cages then you know that's that they're shutting off their nose to spite their face so I hope that in the end, we won't actually use the term natural wine, that all wine is becoming more and more natural. Um, and, um, and the two kind of poles will get closer together. And, and I think being open to all sorts of these new beverages is, is a good thing. I mean, um, uh, I am aware that now there are people making drinks from uh, not just from grapes but say grapes with apples or whatever um and i think you know we've, we've got to embrace that it's uh, it's no good just sort of standing on a sinking ship and uh it's not sinking drastically but but we have got to be aware that wine the sort of wine that maybe someone like me grew up with i think the day of of new consumers wanting to by high scoring, you know, case getting an allocation of cases of a high scoring wine. That's all way past, you know, and and not before time. So we've got to make it exciting and interesting. Yeah, we, and we have to embrace the variety. Off, far too yeah. often, we even uh, wine enthusiasts they pick one style or one thing, and that's all they drink. And they're you know they're they're missing out on lots of opportunity. Yeah, yeah. These, these other beverages just have to find a place into our diet and. Uh, and uh, the, the wine industry itself has to evolve and keep attracting. Mm. Do, do, you, do you think, um, speaking of that, with, and sort of linked to climate change with North America, it has a newfound love for low alcohol wines. And is that at odd with climate change, with increasing uh, warmer wine yeah, regions? It is really, isn't it? And it's, um, I think, I mean, wine producers are very aware of it, most of them. And... Um, I think this move towards organic, as I understand it, means that it's much easier for vine growers to pick grapes a bit riper, a bit, sorry, a bit earlier, but still have lots of flavor in there. Um, and that's, that's a help. But they're, they're, they're really having to pull out all the stops to, to produce lower alcohol wines that do actually have flavor. 
when we talk about regions standing out on their own too, there's um, more and more, and partly with climate change as a response, is looking at indigenous varieties. Might they be better at adapting to the change yes. and to the local? But uh, can, you, can you speak uh, briefly about indigenous varieties, uh, the trend, and uh, how more popular they are becoming to allow regions to stand on their own? Yeah, certainly. It, well, in the 90s, it was really weird. E pretty much every wine producer in the world wanted to make just two sorts of wine. One was a copy of red Bordeaux and the other was a copy of white Burgundy. And, you know, all these indigenous varieties were pulled out and Cabernet and Merlot and Chardonnay planted. But we've seen a sea change and how this century. And I think it goes hand in hand with heritage varieties of fruit and so forth and and Lockervor, you know, only buying what's produced locally. Uh, so in the about, not, about 2010, um, together with my great colleague, Julia Harding and Jose Buemos, who is a great geneticist, we started work on a book, which it became Wine Grapes, um, which in which we wanted to profile every single grape variety that produced wine commercially. And we came, at, the book emerged two years later as wine grapes. Again, this is the uh, UK jacket. I think it's red in, on your side of the Atlantic as all wine books are. Um, and we came up with 1,386 different varieties available in commercially available wines. But such is the interest in indigenous varieties in any second edition, which we'd really like to do, um, I'm sure we'd easily get to 1500. I mean, people are rediscovering old fine varieties everywhere. I don't think it's the case that just because a variety is nearly extinct, it must produce good wine. I think you've got to pick and choose. And there are probably quite a lot of obscure varieties that are obscure for a very good reason. Um, the company Torres, I think uh, set a very good example based in Catalonia. Um, they put ads in the local paper to say, if you've got a vine that you don't recognize, bring it to us and we'll try and identify it. And they came up, I think they came up with 30 previously unknown Catalan grape varieties, planted them, micro vinified them, and then selected, I think six that, that seemed to be promising and making really interesting wine. That's the way to do it, I think. Okay, that's a good strategy. I'm just going to pass back to James for a second to see, bring in some other questions from our right. participants. Absolutely, we've got we've got a ton. Uh, a really interesting um, uh, question in in the chat came up, um, uh, and it relates to what Jancis was talking about: uh, natural wines, uh, low alcohol wines, um, and specifically, what are your thoughts on current trends like low sugar? low calorie, low alcohol wines. Mm. The low alcohol wine seems a bit of a, an oxymoron to me. Um, go for, or you could just go for German, um, you know, which has been making low alcohol wine forever. Um, although admittedly, the lowest alcohol ones have quite a lot of sugar in them. So presumably aren't low, low calorie. Um, I do, I don't, I'm not sure about a, a sort of um, industrial wine producer devising a, um, a formula for low alcohol wine. I suspect it's not going to have much flavor, but I, I think more sensible is to head for regions that naturally produce low alcohol wine and of their own character, like Muscadet, for instance, is generally about 12, isn't it? Um, uh, I mentioned German, um, I mean, you have to head for somewhere that's, that's not baking hot. Um, but uh, apparently, um, this year, the 2021 harvest has been so, the, the growing season in Europe, in many areas, has been so cool and, and cloudy that they've, they've gone back to chaptalization, you know, adding sugar to the fermentation vat which is a sign of, the, sign of re, uh, an exceptional year, exceptionally cool. Um, 
and perhaps the most sensible producers won't resort to adding sugar because and, and they will they will actually just produce lower alcohol wines which may well find a ready market let's talk about uh, you know wine and, and demystifying it has, has do you think the industry is being successful in making wine less intimidating i think so um and actually one of the um one of the drivers i think which often poo-pooed by the wine establishment is the emergence of these celebrity wines. You know, we think to ourselves, does Kylie Minogue really know how to make wine or whatever? Um, but, you know, they bring people in. Um, and, you know, some of those wines aren't bad at all. So I, I'm all for them, actually. And, um, whole, you know, if a baseball star is going to be making their own champagne, great. I mean, that's really good for the for the whole market, I think. I think there comes a time that's how we have to look at it. Sometimes it's a more casual approach. It's fashion, it's celebrity, and it's making uh, it, it's making it more approachable. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm less enthusiastic about that brand that sells itself as clean wine, sort of uh, uh, implying that everything else is dirty. You know, there's a lot of mealy mouthed sales talk in that. I think, but no, just a celebrity bringing, you know, being enthusiastic about wine, particularly a younger one. I think that's great. Now, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, packaging. We thought we were talking earlier about heavy glass, lighter glass and things like that. And for many consumers, our participant list today, is the demographics are wide. So um, what about screwed caps or bag in a box? Uh, are, is this something people should avoid or is there anything no, of quality? Definitely not. No, 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 no. There are a lot of um, wine producers, very, very quality conscious, who, def who choose to use a screw cap because they know that what the consumer will get out of the bottle is what they put into it. And I, as I said earlier, I just, uh, it is so frustrating to open a, a cork stoppered bottle and find that the wine is completely ruined because the of cork taint um so no i i i very much respect wine producers who choose screw caps on a quality basis rather than because they're cheaper um and i i, I know there is an argument that cork forests play a greater part in sustainability than um screw cap manufacturing um, bag in box saves a lot of pack, you know, the, the glass bottles are so heavy. Um, and as, and it, the, it is complex, the whole recycling and materials is all very, very complex issue and too detailed for me to go into here. But I think the quality of wine in bag in box has got better and better, which is great. And, and it really makes a, it makes sense. And in a restaurant setting as well, you know, big, big boxes or kegs that and refillables that's all makes huge sense to me it does, and it, it's convenient and it's practical yeah, and and cans you know cans for picnics and and all the rest i'm i'm all for alternatives to glass bottles in the right circumstances i i'm not suggesting that you know first growth, growth bordeaux should hurl itself into anything other than a a, a glass bottle but um I think it's horses for courses, really. And there are so many wines which are packaged in bottles that really don't need to be. And also... Alternate, alternate packaging gives, gives room for making it more friendly in other occasions rather than the yeah. dinner table. And also, I mean, thinking about new people coming into wine and younger people, 75 centiliters is quite a lot. You know, um, unless you're sharing a bottle with quite a lot of friends... That's a big, it's also a big financial commitment. So any, any way of selling wine in smaller units that people can, can afford more easily, I think is going to do the wine market a lot of good. Good. Um, let's talk old world, new world. Um, is, it getting, is it getting harder to identify the essential differences between oh, old yes. world wines and new yeah. world wines? Yeah. No, I'm just writing an article at the moment about a, a, a wonderful wine consultant who has clients all over the world, Alberto Antononi, Antonini. And he points out, he's, he was raving about the geology of, of Australia, the soils in Australia. 
and saying, you know, geology doesn't know the difference, doesn't know where old world starts and new world ends, you know. Um, it's all, it is just one world. And now that we are, as we've said earlier, we're, we're exchanging information and, and, and aims and techniques as much as we are. Um, no, I mean, there are some differences, but um, nothing like, say, back in the 80s, where we got very, very hung up on the difference between the old and the new world. Often said that South African wines, you know, are a good bridge of old world and new world styles. Um, do you think South Africa is getting the respect it deserves? No, not on your side of the Atlantic. Um, when we we don't want you all to fall in love with South Africa because then the prices are going to go up. <laughs> <laughs> but I do feel sorry for the producers because they've had life so difficult recently. I mean, the government keeps putting total bans on. Uh, they're they're pretty anti the wine industry and um and you know the, you know, the pandemic has been used as an excuse to stifle sales and there was one stage i think when they weren't even allowed to export so they're really under the cosh there let's talk about happier things uh the st study and wine appreciation is a journey and journeys are often more interesting when you have that trusted advisor uh for consumers uh, looking to get more information, you know, what recommended resources might you have for them? Of course, there's genesisrobinson.com. Exactly, you're playing <laughs> into my hands here. <laughs> there is, there's a huge section there called Learn, which is all free. And in fact, I think about one in three of the articles we publish are free as well. So I'm not touting for memberships. I'm, I'm just saying there is a, a free resource there. Um, but we are lucky, aren't we? There are so many things, particularly online, that are free. Uh, I mean, a lot of the um, regional websites are very informative. And we have a list of the one of sort of approved ones there, you know, a list of regions and what their best generic website is. Um, but, you know, if, if someone says to me, I, I really like wine and I want to learn more about it, I should say, well, go to glancesrobinson.com or buy one of my books, particularly perhaps my tiny little 24-hour um, wine expert, which is a tiny, tiny book, um, which came out of my 24-year-old daughter at one stage deciding to write a guide to wine for her friends. And she did all the research and then took up a job at Vogue. So, But I didn't like to waste all her work, so I turned it into my book. Um, but um, I actually don't say any of those things. I say, find a local wine merchant and establish a relationship with them. Tell them which wines you have enjoyed so far. And it's in their interests to guide you to something similar, but better perhaps. Um, and you know, really keep feeding you because human contact can't be beaten. I mean, I, you know, I know I produce books and videos and things like that but to actually be able to ask questions and get responses and and go and tell them well actually I quite like that wine but it was a bit too sweet for me or whatever it is in their interest to keep you happy and there's nothing that wine professionals like more than talking about wine and they love responsive customers and if the first you know if you live in a city and the first person doesn't work out then try somewhere else but I think that that leads you on that's a good point. We, we, we like talking about wine. We, and we like guiding people along. And it's, uh, I guess, what I keep uh, trying to encourage consumers is don't be afraid to ask. We mm -hmm. all ask questions. I bet you even ask questions. If you're out in a restaurant and see a wine list, you're talking to the psalm, would you engage in conversation? Oh, yes. I think I ask more questions of the, the sommelier than practically any other um customer because i'm not embarrassed i'm you know i'm confident in what i know and i jolly well know what i don't know so if i see uh, something that doesn't resonate with me i'll interrogate them like mad and they love that because that's as long as they're not rushed off their feet i mean that's what they like talking about i think there's a very strong parallel between we mentioned the um cookbook store uh between bookshops and wine shops and they are, tend to be staffed by enthusiasts. And, you know, you'd often go into a bookshop and say, oh, I, 
I, lo I love the works of Alison Lurie or whatever. What else can you recommend that might be similar? It's just the same kind of operation in a wine store. That's a good analogy, a good analogy. And people are interested in learning and um, has, has educate, wine education kept up with the demand and, you know, how do we how do we reach customers? You can go to yes. classes. You can do things online. Wine tourism. Um, wine tourism. Mm, well, or, or just generally visiting wine producers is a is a great yes. thing to do, if if you know the pandemic allows. Um, there's one major way in which I think wine education has not kept up with demand, and that's vocabulary, tasting vocabulary. Now that um, there are so many consumer, wine consumers who are not in Europe or not in an Anglophone society. And, you know, there's a big gap here. For instance, often New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc is described as tasting of gooseberries. And apparently, you know, no one in China knows what a gooseberry is. That's just sort of one of many, many examples. So there are people working on this. And I know the Wine and Spirit Education Trust, which is the biggest global educator, has a kind of task force trying to um, uh, fill this gap. But um, I think that that can be a problem. And the way that the, the words we use to describe wine tend to be um, specific to a particular culture. But now we have myriad cultures interested in wine. Very good observation. Uh, what about online learning? I understand that you're uh, you're involved in a project. Uh... Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, the BBC, the Good Old British Broadcasting Corporation, is um, attempting to give masterclass a run for its money with a series of online courses, and have asked me to present the one about about wine, which is quite interesting. Distilling all that information into that format. That's great fun. <laughs> but uh, um, I have done quite a lot of television and filming in my time. So it's not, um, uh, you know, it doesn't fill me with, uh, you know, I, I, I'm quite comfortable doing it. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of work. It's a whole different, uh, it's a whole different communication yeah. channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a very successful video series that uh, that's on YouTube uh, at the LCBO. Um, and you know some of those episodes are getting a million and a half views. Great. People that they love to see, they love to read, but they bring it to life for them uh, visually in a, you know where you're touching on food and culture and wine, and that really draws their attention. Yeah. Um, as as many consumers start to get more interested in wine, by by default, many of them start collecting. Can you, can you share any tips or strategies for somebody that's going to think about starting to collect wines? Yeah, I think the collecting habit is waning, personally. Um, I think younger wine drinkers are, are more interested in pick and mix and trying something and then trying something else and then trying something else rather than amassing a permanent collection. And I don't know what your wine storage facilities are like in, in Canada. But certainly in the UK, where we have some really good quality storage, it's all cold and damp and underground and all the rest. Um, it's expensive, you know? People think when they're buying a, a, a wine young, like en primeur Bordeaux, they think that what they pay is, is it, but it's not. They, they have to take into account each year's storage charges. Um, yeah, um, and also, you know, with professional storage, it's a lot more difficult just to pick one bottle there and one bottle there, you know, you more or less have to take it out case, one case at a time. What is the, the general habit in, in Canada for wine storage? Well, most people store at home, but there have been a few uh, entrepreneurs that have opened up wine cellars and uh, taken a club approach to it that, that's, mm -hmm. that's quite successful and, uh, and, is, and is starting to expand. Because storing at home, you, you do have to um, be quite careful. You have to make sure that it's cool enough, don't you? And, yeah. you know, your summers can be quite hot. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Thankfully. <laughs> yeah, yes. But, you know, that probably means you've got, you've got to invest in some refrigeration too, unless you happen to have an underground cellar. Thank heavens for, for um, underground coolness. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. 
Now, what, one of the big parts about wine and wine appreciation is tasting. One of the biggest challenges is describing what you're tasting mm. uh, and developing that memory. Uh, can you can you share any 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 tips for to help mm. guide people uh, as they undertake that? I wish. Um, I think it does help to attach words to sensations, and uh, even if they're quite inaccurate, there's something to hang that sensation on. So, for instance, you know those of us who are professionals. When we smell Gewürztraminer, we say, oh, that's spicy, that smell. And it's not actually like any particular spice. What we mean is that smells like Gewürztraminer and Gewürz means spiced. And you know, we're sort of using the word, not literally, but as a, as a, a prompt. Um, and it doesn't, unless you're, you've really got to uh, write very accurate tasting notes, say for an exam or, or if you're a wine writer or something, it doesn't matter too much what your, your prompt words are, just as long as you use them consistently. Um, you know, cedar with, with red mature red Bordeaux. Well, it probably isn't actually smelling that much like cedar, but uh, it does, mm -hmm. it's a sort of hook, a trigger. Exactly, exactly. Um, so writing things down actually probably does help. And, and um, I think the key thing is just writing. Just yeah. writing something down to start yourself yeah. that gives you a point of reference. Yeah, yeah. It. yeah. It's, it, but it's, it's an experience thing. Um, on the other hand, I often find that newcomers to wine come up with much better descriptions because, you know, I've used all my descriptors, you know, hundreds of times over, but they'll come up with something really fresh um, that, that perhaps a, a more seasoned taster would never have thought of. Um, do you think people drink enough white wine? No. Nope. White wine get a bad rap. Yeah, definitely. Um, there was a, a, a very interesting map that I tweeted today, but actually it was only of Europe, I'm afraid, that one of our importers who specializes in organic wines, Vintage Roots, had come up with. And they, they came up with a, a map of Europe with each country colored according to their favorite color of wine. And it was mostly red. Um, Austria was white. Um, I think Poland was white. Um, not many whites, but they claim um, the UK is, is pink. Uh, I do know we drink a lot of pink. I, I wasn't aware that it was the number one favorite, but anyway. Um, but no, I don't think we, I, I think we, we don't take white wine seriously enough because lots of white wines age just as well as as red wines. I did a, an interesting tasting once demonstrating that Mosul Riesling lasted at least as long as red Bordeaux. Um, and, and also white wine is delicious and it's more versatile. It goes with more foods than red wine um, and, uh, and it's very um, lovely aperitif too. So no, I'm very pro white wine. You need all colors. Yes. I'm gonna I'm gonna reach out to James for a few more questions from our uh, from our guests. Right. Um, here's a good question that relates to a uh, recent uh, discussion in around white wines and and versatility with food. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Miriam's asking about uh, pairing tips specifically for spicy and or umami laden foods, very savory styles of food. How do you um, I find uh, pairings are with the complexity of vinegar, like balsamic glazes or reductions, um, or sweeter sauces like uh, barbecue or, or pulled pork. What mm. What are your sort of thoughts on on pairing with those elements? Yeah, I'm afraid I'm horribly libertarian when it comes to um, food pairing, um, and I always think, well, if the wine if it doesn't work, just have a mouthful of water or bread, and you know, in between. Um, but I do think with, with spicy foods, quite sort of big Swedish reds go pretty well. Um, I think way back there was, in Britain anyway, there was this fashion for pairing uh, spicy food with Gewürztraminer because of that word spice. It didn't necessarily work all that well. Um, I was just re reading a tasting note now, actually, that I'd written last week on an Amarone. And I think you sell it. Amarone is hugely popular in Canada, isn't it? 
and this was a particularly good Amarone and and with that with some sweetness and 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 it did have some spiciness and I, I actually wrote in my tasting note I can't wait to try a wine like this the next time I have a, an Indian meal that's one sort of spice of course I mean the huge array of spices and then this whole Thai array um, which probably do go better with with white wines aromatic white wines and Chinese food kind of forget it because you you're going to have you know a hundred different flavors and textures on the table at the same time um, what was the other one umami um, sherry perhaps lovely fino or manzanilla sherry um, and as for vinegar I don't think vinegar is the enemy of wine that we once thought it was I love vinegary foods I think perhaps because I love wine and I appreciate that acidity um, and that acidity when you when you're putting it with food it can soften things out yeah. it can level out a wine so that yeah. it can bring together a balance yeah yeah so uh, um and and you know there are so many salad -y type dishes and savory dishes with sort of balsamic reductions and things around at the moment i think we just have to be quite um non-conservative and, and experiment a bit i'm sorry not to but I, I'm, I'm pretty anti being too prescriptive, really. And I think that the whole, I'm afraid, I think the whole um, uh, subject of pairing, while I hugely admire people who do come up with what they reckon are the ideal pairings, I would never overemphasize it because I think it makes people rather insecure. They think, oh, I better not have drink this wine with that food because it's not the perfect combination. Um, you know, it, it is a bit intimidating, I think, to overemphasize perfect pairings. Much as I love um, my friend Evan Goldstein's book of the same name and, uh, <laughs> and admire all the work of Francois Chartier um, uh, on his, um, you know, special scientific pairings. Thank you. You sum it up nicely on your website. There's a quote that I that I liked and when it came to wine and food, and it was the most important rule about wine and food is matching is that there are no rules. You can drink any wine with any food, even red wine with fish. And the world will continue to revolve. Anyone who thinks the worst of you for serving the wrong wine is stuffy, prejudiced, and probably ill-informed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's true you should drink some things are better with others but drink, I think drink what I you think, like yeah I mean after yeah. a certain time and experience I think we have little computers in our heads that we don't know about that we if we know we're going to eat such and such a thing that tastes like so and so we it kind of homes in on a food that's a wine that's likely to go with it on the basis of past experience and, and one wine that when it comes to food uh, that I, I think um, doesn't get enough respect is sparkling wine, mm -hmm. uh, because it's not just for the occasion. It's not for a celebration. It, it is a food wine. And uh, we did a, a tasting one time. We went to a, a Japanese restaurant in Toronto and brought in a case of Prosecco. And we opened the whole, we ordered the whole menu just to see yeah. how Prosecco went with food. And it was delicious with everything but sea urchin. Ah, well, see, it's a learned, very particular flavor, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and you you can live life quite happily without ever eating sea urchin. Yeah. But, yeah it, it was fine. <laughs> Prosecco is is uh, it's leading a worldwide trend to sparkling wine. It's casual. It's fun. It's easy to drink. It's inexpensive. Mm -hmm. Can other uh, sparkling wines ride this wave? How can they get on board? Mm, Carver's missed the boat, hasn't it? Um, for complex reasons. Um, and, and there aren't many other sparkling wines that are as inexpensive, apart from Carver, as Prosecco. Um, I always love being able to find a, a good sparkling wine that's not too expensive. I'm a bit of a fan of Cremant de Jura. Um, they're not heavy, they're, very, they're light, and they're very well made, um, and not expensive. Uh, Cremant are the, are the other good value. Yeah, for sure. For yeah. sure. Yeah. Now, the pandemic is leaving the wine industry damaged in its wake, and the wine business has suffered. 
Uh, Jancis, could you elaborate on the impact of the pandemic and how the wine industry continues to be affected? There's been pluses and minuses, haven't there? I mean, the poor old hospitality industry, I, I know well, because our son has three restaurants in London and he's, he's pivoted so hard. He's been pirouetting, uh, doing all sorts of different things and come out of it absolutely fine. Thanks for a lot of hard work. But the poor people who work in the industry have suddenly found themselves without a job. And, and so many of them have not come back, sort of creating massive problems. Um, uh, but a lot of the online retailers have done, did very well during lockdown, didn't they? Um, you know, certainly in, in the UK, there was a, just a huge move to online ordering. And the, the, the companies that were nimble really did actually benefit. And I think... And then, of course, there's, there's the aspect that there was nothing for people to spend their money on for, for all that time. And certainly the restaurants here are absolutely buzzing and wine merchants say they're buzzing with people buying fine wine. I think some people have, who could afford it have been moving up the scale a bit. You know, they've been thinking, well, if I'm not allowed to go out, I'm going to treat myself to something, uh, you know, wine that's slightly better than I, I used to drink. So. Um, the, you know, as I say, it hasn't all been bad for wine. Certainly it changed my life hugely. Wasn't allowed to travel to wine regions. There were no professional wine tastings. So instead of me going to the wine, the wine came to me. And um, that actually had the, the, the advantage of me being able to spend a little bit longer on individual wines than fighting my way through the hordes at a professional wine tasting. So again, that wasn't all, all bad. Um, it meant opening a heck of a lot of bottles, but and um, your recycling well, bin. <laughs> yeah. Um, what other? Yeah, I don't. I don't know how we're going to reconfigure our travel plans. You know, I, I'll I'll feel more guilty about flying certainly than than I used to. And um, Hugh Johnson and I went to Germany the other day by train and came back by train, that was quite interesting. It, it probably took about one hour longer each way than flying would have done in total. Now, in the UK and across Europe, are you starting to see, because um, trade tastings and anything with large gatherings were just not happening. Mm. Uh, are, we, are we seeing that uh, rebound? Yeah, a bit? The, the, the London is very active um, wine tasting calendar, I'd say is perhaps at, um, looking at my diary, probably it's about at 75% usual, norm, what we call normal now. Um, but, you know, we have, we're, we're very worried about COVID rates here in the UK. And, um, you know, I, I'm increasingly wary of, I'm a big fan of public transport, but at the moment I'm warier and warier of it, um, you know, as, as cases go up. So, and that some people organizing tastings are being very good and, um, you know, checking everybody going in with their temperature and, and some of them are sit down tastings where you'll be served by masked pourers. But some tastings are back to the old scrum, you know. What has um, disappeared, for, which is good, um, we no longer seem to be sharing spittoons. We're issued with a paper cup and, it's, uh, whoever gives it to you puts your initials on the paper cup so there's less interchange of liquid and air and all the rest um but it we're, i feel we're in a transitional phase definitely it's a brave it's a whole new world we have to get brave and rethink everything mm, mm. let's um let's talk about uh, wine writing and uh, wine scores or, or a point system mm. um is it needed? And does it really tell the true story? Well, I see scores as a necessary evil. Um, I don't, you know, I, I certainly don't think wine can be summed up in, by a number. It's def and I think that all of us who, who write tasting notes would urge people to read the notes, read the words rather than just follow the numbers. And I also tend to find that readers attach too much significance to the numbers. And, um, but if it's, uh, uh, it's a sort of wine that's like 
en prima that in a vintage that everybody wants. People don't have a lot of time. They want to pounce on the best wines. I can see that the scores are useful to them. Um, and I suppose it does focus the mind of the writer that it will remind you just how much you admired the wine or not having to assign a number to it. Um, but it's, uh, I, I can't say I, I like scores, no. <laughs> I, I, I kind of like your scoring system. You know, it's, it's out of 20 rather than the 100 and it's practical. And the out of 100, those scores out of 100 tend to be a little, uh, uh, um, imply perhaps too much precision. And you may have noticed we, we are um, on the basis that wine's getting better every year. We are, we've left a bit of headroom for the wines to continue to get better every year. So for us, 18 out of 20 is a very high score. We do have quite a few 20s and, and 19s, but 18 is the sort of to aim for, uh, I know. And so when all wine is 20% better than it is today, we'll be okay. We'll, we've still got somewhere to go. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I, I know consumers love wines, but wine buyers, uh, in, in wine shops and stuff. Should, should they be buying on points or buying on quality? Do they, do they lose their independence by just by using one of those strategies for purchasing? You mean professional wine buyers? Yes. Yeah. Now, one of the sad things I've witnessed in my professional life is wine merchants abdicating responsibility and not making their own selections, but just going by, by numbers. And I think it's worse on your side of the Atlantic than on ours. Um, but even some in the fine wine market, certainly we've got masses of fine wine traders here, you know, who are selling cases of Bordeaux and stuff. They tend, they pretty much always um, include the, the points in their sales pitch, which is a shame, I think. Um, but, you know, if I were a wine merchant with my own store, I would want to be selling things that personally I could get behind and could tell the stories of and perhaps things which I could say, I found this and, you know, you won't find this anywhere else or you know um so I, I admire the the wine retailers who do their own thing rather than just slavishly following points uh let's talk about wine pricing do you have any strategies for finding value in wine pricing at all price points or is there a, a point where it's just uh, the values um, may not be there I've certainly noted, I mean, wine prices here anyway have been zooming up over the last two years, maybe more. There's the Brexit factor, there's the supply chain factor, um, there's small vintages, frosts and so on. Um, I'm always very, very keen on value. I, I, I try, I, we have a thing, we we add to our tasting notes either GV for good value or VGV, very good value, or occasionally VVGV. And um, whenever I, I do know the price, I try to highlight when I think something is a good buy. And we have a wine of the week every Friday, and generally they're things which we think are underpriced, whatever category they're in. Um, and I do think there are far too many wines. I, I don't, I've never thought that there's a direct correlation between quality and price. And there are a heck of a lot of wines that are priced highly because of a marketing strategy or, you know, um, somebody just thinks their wine is marvelous, but there's no, there's no proof of that. Um, I think there are an awful lot of overpriced wines. Yeah. When you think of what wine, Go ahead. I mean, what, wine is not expensive to produce. At, at the beginning of the um, the, eight, the World Atlas of Wine, we have a table which um, shows all the costs that go into, actually, I think it's in the Bordeaux section nowadays because it's about Bordeaux. And it's the, yeah, the uh, what it costs to make Bordeaux and total costs per bottle of even a top second growth Bordeaux are, I think it's in euros, yeah, 16 euros a bottle, which is when you think they're selling for, you know, three, sometimes four figure sums now. There's a lot of profit margin in there. <laughs> uh, 
Let's reach out to James again to uh, get a couple other comments and questions from our participants. Very good, thanks. I got a ton of questions here and, and trying to work through these in order. Well, we've only got um, five minutes left too. There we go. <laughs> so right. um, uh, your recommended drinking window is sometimes different than other critics. Um, how do you determine your recommendation on a drinking window for a wine? It's just what I think. Um, I, I certainly don't check, compare them with other critics. Uh, I don't compare anything with other critics because that way madness lies. Um, it's just based on my opinion and tasting the wine, looking if it's red at the tannin and the fruit balance um, and on past experience to a certain extent. Can you share your perspective on diversity in the wine industry in the UK? Mm, I'm glad someone asked that. Funnily enough, uh, the reason I've got to go out is for a meeting with my colleague, Mags Janjo. We've set up a website called bamewineprofessionals.co.uk to try and celebrate non-white participants in the UK wine industry. Um, and I'm, I'm also very closely involved with these Golden Vines scholarships, which have been giving wine professionals of colour massive awards. Um, UK, we've got a way to go. We're way behind the US in terms of um, the participants participation in the wine industry of people of color. Um, we we're working on it. Uh, the spirits sector is better than we are, um, which is rather shameful. Um, if we're going to inclusion rather than diversity, life has got better for women in the wine business in my time. Um, I've never experienced prejudice, but then I'm, I'm a parasite on the industry I'm not actually in it I've never sold wine I'm not really in the trade uh, but I do see more and more women getting positions of power in in the UK but I'm I'm still horrified by some tales that I hear of particularly in the hospitality business uh, harassment and so forth uh, so I've just been very lucky to escape all that I've been very lucky full stop actually or period as you would probably say <laughs> Uh, you've had an amazing career. You've been very fortunate through it. Well, I'm very, very like I have worked very hard, but I, yeah. I've been in the right place at the right time, just as, as wine was taking off in the UK. So what's next for Jancis Robinson? Um, we, uh, I recently sold JancisRobinson.com to an American digital company that has 15 other um, websites, including the one for Saber, the food magazine. So we're just getting, because I, I, I realized I needed to have a secure a future for the team. Um, and I also wanted more marketing and tech expertise than we are good at. So at the moment, I, that happened at the end of August. So we're in a kind of um, a phase where we're all getting to know each other and, and integrating now. So that's quite exciting. Um, I'm responsible, the lead editorship of the Oxford Companion to Wine has switched to Julia Harding, who is a very ably assisted by Tara Q. Thomas of Wine and Spirits magazine. And I'm responsible for just 10%, updating just 10% of the entries, including fashion. Um, so I, my, in my horribly overcrowded schedule, I've got to make time to um, complete uh, the updates of those 10%. And then there's the, the online wine course, um, we've married off the children, um, so that'll do for now, yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you've had an amazing career. You've had a profound impact on the world, uh, the wine industry, and it's been long lasting and profound. Well, that's very kind. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, <laughs> what, what does that mean for you personally? Do you ever take a step back and say, wow, or really? No, not really. The, the children are keep my feet very firmly on the ground. They don't really, you know, believe that I do anything worthwhile. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, funnily enough, I had a, an email uh, um, yesterday, was it from um, uh, a student at Cornell um, who fixed up a, who knew me, fixed up a Zoom with some fellow students. And he said he'd been in a, a, a wine tasting room in Napa and he'd heard, it was a young couple, and he'd heard one of them say to the other, 
Jancis says, blah, 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 blah. And the other one said, and Jancis is always right. And he said, Do you, don't you feel overwhelmed by the responsibility of being right? And da, da, da. and I, I, I don't feel overwhelmed because I just say what I think and believe. And, 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 I, and I just find it hugely flattering that there is, there does seem to be a sort of, family of people, wine lovers around the world who perhaps know me through my books or whatever else I've done. Um, and, and who, you know, feel positively about me and, and would welcome, you know, it's nice to be able, in the old days when one could travel around the world, you could generally find, you know, someone who knew who you were and, and felt positively about you. That's, a, this has been wonderful. I want to thank you for your time. We've covered a lot of ground. Yeah. And it's been both enlightening and enjoyable. Oh, thank want, you, Michael. I want to thank George Brown College and the Center for the Hospitality and Culinary Arts. James, I want to thank you for moderating the chat room and speaking on behalf of the participants. I want to thank our viewers for their time, their engaging questions and comments. And finally, Jancis, thank you. You've given us a lot to think about and much to look forward to in the world of wine. It's with fingers crossed that I hope the world returns to a new normal that offers safe international travel, a return to group tastings and educational events. Our symposium is planned for late June, 2022. In Jancis, we would welcome the opportunity to have you present in person, lead a tasting and continue the dialogue. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. <laughs>